Hello, and thank you for joining me. I'm going to turn my camera because it's a little off. Ha ha ha, nailed it. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Tabletop Table Talk. It has been a little bit. Um, I took a little bit of a break to uh, just relax, enjoy life. Um, I am set up in my new place, my new office, and I feel good. I... As many of you know, I am Roll20's in-house game designer, Gabe. Uh, you can find me across the internet at Gabe James Games. If you don't know and this is your first time here, welcome on in. Uh, Tabletop Table Talk is a show where I sit, talk with all of you. We talk about what it is to be a GM, what it is to be a DM, what it is to tell stories, how we can be better at it, how we can enjoy ourselves, and also making sure that we never forget that at the end of the day, the beginning of the day, and in the middle of the day, the storyteller is also still a player. They are someone who is here to enjoy, have fun, and tell a story with the rest of their party. So today I wanted to talk about GM tips and tricks. Now I was saying it a little bit in the pre-show, but none of what I'm saying is explicitly the way it has to be. None of what I'm saying is going to be a perfect solution. None of what I'm saying is exactly what you have to follow. Excuse me. My hope here is that by listening, by coming in, by just hanging out and talking through this stuff, you will at least feel like you're a little bit better, a little bit more prepared, or a little bit a little bit in a better mindset and mind state to tell a story with a delightful group of people in your party. So if you want to ask a question during the show, don't forget, you can put the word QUESTION in all caps and then type your question afterwards and I will answer the question. I realize that there have been some questions in like the YouTube comments and so I'm actually going to try to work uh, with my team and go through those as well. So if you're watching on Twitch right now, thank you for popping in. If you're watching this on YouTube later and you have a question that you want to come up, you also can put question in all caps and then I'll go back through and find some of those questions and try to answer them on stream during the next episode. That way that you can still be involved even if you don't get the chance to catch this live. So something that I've had to learn is, I'm just gonna say GM because it's it's more general. Um, I had to I had to learn, which is sad, that the GM is also a player, and I've been trying to break my mindset whenever I talk about uh, the people that I'm playing with and I'm GMing. I try to say my party instead of saying uh, my players. And I do that because I want to let myself still feel like a player, if that makes sense. Um, I want to still feel like I am just a member playing the game and I just have a different position than Paladin or Rogue or Ranger or ed Edge Runner or like Hacker. like. And I have a, I have a, I have a little introductory, introductory spiel written for you. Uh. Some of the stuff is going to feel like common sense. Some of the stuff is going to be something you may have considered but not thought about deeply. And some of the stuff you might know all of it already. All of the stuff is opinion. I'm not going to have the perfect guide or have all the answers, but if I have some that will help you, then that's enough. These are some of what I think are the best tips and tricks you can have as a DM. There's no top priority in the organization of this list. It's more just as my brain was thinking of them. So number one, one of the best tips that I found is using yes and. Not always, but sometimes. When a member of the party asks if they can try something uh, or asks if, if it's possible or say they want to do this, um, there's, there's that whole sense of like, you can certainly try or like, go ahead and try or like, and that's, that's kind of a yes end because it's, it's letting people try something, even if it fails, because failure can be a great storytelling tool. And it doesn't have to be someone's trying to climb up a wall and failure is a storytelling tool to the sense that like they try to climb up the wall and then they fail and you make them fall and break a leg or something. No, it's I, I say it's, failure can be a storytelling tool in the sense that if you want the wall they're climbing to actually be fortified against people climbing the wall, someone tries to start climbing the wall and they realize that it's 
it's warm to the touch or it's like extremely cold or touching the wall they get stuck and they're not able to they're not able to avoid or or they notice there's a thin layer of oil on the wall just something to take that failure so can i like them asking can i try to climb this wall yes and when you do when you do so when you try to do this thing like it if they want to try something allowing them to try something it's not something you always have to do you don't always have to have people try to push buttons or push the edge of the envelope or do every little thing that's possible but sometimes you can use those moments to make the story interesting you can add to the story you can make it fun you can let them try something yes and when you do that yes and when you make this role yes and when you attack them you can you can use that moment to tell them to teach them to give them more bits of the story that you haven't given them before you can use those moments to grow and have fun and and treat it as a, a way of like sneaking in information you might have snuck in before. Um, there was a moment where a player of mine, a party member of mine, excuse me, a party member of mine who, what were they trying to do? They were trying to uh, listen in on a conversation through a wall. Um, and so they were like, I want to, I want to hear like in between the things of what they're saying. So I'm like, okay, uh, go ahead and roll and, and try it. Uh, so you do that. Yes. And what you hear is like, you can narratively make it that it they tried something and it just didn't work rather than saying, nope, you fail. Nothing happens. Cause then it's also at least, at least they get something you can, you can give them something even when they fail. It doesn't have to be game changing. It doesn't have to be mind blowing. But sometimes just feeling like you get something is enough. So one of the second tips that I would give is relying on your table. Having someone at your table, playing with someone at a table is in a lot of way giving them a sense of trust. And you want to like when you when you have friends over, when you're playing a board game, when you're playing a video game, when you're doing co-op stuff, you rely on each other, especially if you know the people. If you don't know the people, sometimes it's it's almost a gamble, I guess is the best word, because you're hoping that you can rely on them to have fun with you. You can rely on them to um, trust your judgment when you're trying to do something, or you can work together. It's because this is collaborative storytelling. When When you're GMing, when you're running for a group of people and you want to give them a story to engage in. You might have to rely on them to help you tell the story. Uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like you should. You should rely on them because you're building this world together. You're telling the story together. You might have dozens and dozens and dozens of pages of what the story can be and what this story probably will be, but you shouldn't have to have all of the information. You should be able to rely on your party to fill in some tidbits where you just have blank pages. And making those blank pages allows you to rely on them. And when they meet that standard, when they meet what you were hoping for, when you're like, I don't know uh, who it was that was this forgotten king. And one of your players, uh, ugh, Lord, one of your party members, uh, it talks about having a noble background. And they were like, well, actually, could, could we make it so that my father was the lost king? And then they give you this backstory. They give you this conversation, and it gives you new ideas. And it was giving you a moment to rely on them to, to take this thing that you've created, to take this thing that you were optimistic and hopeful and prepared for and building a story with, and rely on them to, to take it, make it even better, expand on it, and improve it. And that kind of actually leads to my third point, building a mutual trust. And it's another moment where like, that doesn't seem like it, some people might think that that doesn't seem like it's a tip. Um, but it is not something that is always innate. I have played it many tables where even trying to build a sense of mutual trust, I just didn't have it. Whether I didn't trust the GM 
or I didn't trust my like party members. Whether I was GM and I was excited about telling a story with people that I shared the story with, and they had no interest at all, um, even after we talked about it. Because it's, it's the hope that these people want to share in this excitement with you and don't necessarily. Or uh, you talk about lines that you have or things that you want don't want to delve into or things that you're comfortable delving into and things you're comfortable talking about and needing and wanting to have that trust of what will and won't come up. Because when you build a mutual trust with your party member, they will trust you to make some wild choices. If, if the person controlling this character trusts you and they're comfortable with you, it's going to open you up to a new world of possibilities because they know you won't abuse that trust. Then you can ex explore even more interesting things. There are plenty of times when uh, I, I knew a character death was imminent and my GM was like checking in, like, is this good? Is this okay? I want to make sure this is fine. Like, is it's just a minor, minor encounter. It, if you actively feel a certain way, we can direct this another way. But the check-ins, like I knew, I knew that they weren't trying to go out of their way to kill my character. I knew they weren't trying to go out of their way to make this a, like a difficult thing for my character to deal with in, in a way that was unfair. I trusted that like this was just the way the game turned out because I had that trust with this person. And building that trust, that is going to make a foundation for you when you're playing these games with these people. So level of preparedness. Your level of preparedness does not have to match someone else's. My level of preparedness when it comes to GMing varies every single time that I do it. There have been times that I ran one shots and I had 12 pages of notes for a one shot. There are times that I ran one shots and I wrote two sentences and that's all that I actually remembered to write down. And then I couldn't even remember where I wrote those two sentences. So everything else that I came up with was just off the top of my head. There are GMs all around who will talk about their level of preparedness. You will see them have notes on like 30 different NPCs. They will have names, birthdays, backgrounds, family trees, histories. And if you want to do that, I absolutely support you in doing it. You are not required to do that to be a good GM. If that is what lets you be a good GM, if that is what has you feel like it makes you a good GM, then absolutely do it. But it is not a requirement for you to do so. That does not define what makes you a good GM. What will make you a good GM is when you can have a good time and the people you're playing with have that same feeling. And if your level of preparedness needs to be, you have a couple random charts, you have three paragraphs of notes, you have a couple sentences written down and that's what you use, then you the rest of it is improv, the rest of it is on your is off the top of your head. Because the over preparedness to some people it makes them anxious. Over preparedness can be frustrating because depending on the group you have, they might not go at all where you're hoping they go. They might see something that you say and just go completely off the rails. And that happens to me all the time all the time and this so this this actually does uh relate to something that i had written down and someone mentioned how do you get over stage fright i think that comes in i think that comes from a couple places um one of the reasons that i said like the trust and being able to trust that table even just a little bit is that if you mess up that it's okay because more than anything else Everyone there should be there to have fun. And <laughs> the nice thing about being a GM is if you mess up, technically no one has to know. You can play it off. Um, so, so Pyro, one of my favorite GMing moments was I was GMing a murder mystery game that I was doing. And I've talked about it before on the show. I was GMing a murder mystery 
and I there I came up with like five NPCs, <laughs> and I just like was putting them into the world, and then people the the party was messing around and talking to them and all that stuff, and I had named uh, the benefactor like Adrian Crow or something. And then when they met one of the NPCs, they met an NPC whose name was like Juliana Crow. And let me tell you, Pyro, that was not on purpose. I had accidentally reused another name. I did not realize at all, like in my planning, that I had reused like a last name. So when the party met this person, they're like, wait, uh, Crow, are you related to our benefactor? And I kid you not, in my head, I it's it's like the, if you know about the the Twix moment, uh, like they say, bite and Twix, and like time like slows down, and then you're processing everything. My whole brain started working like one thousand percent speed because in my head, I'm like, oh no. I gave them the same last name. I did not mean to give them the same last name. What do I do? 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 And and the moment that happened was like, yes, we are related. That's my cousin. They and they they never knew that I messed up. Um, they had no idea that I had messed up because it's it's just kind of that rolling with the punches. When you're the storyteller. Anything that might be you messing up or falling over or tripping over words or stumbling, you can still use that. You can still use that as a story point if you want to. You could you could have an NPC that just forgot information if you actually forget information. And in, in the moments when you do literally just say, oh, I, I just don't remember or that was an accident. If the people at your table, like they, if they did sincerely just come here to play and have a good time. They're going to understand it. They're going to forgive it. They're going to respect that. They, that's what we're here for. And they're, they're putting that trust into you to tell a story with them together. So another tip is knowing what type of players you have. Um, like everyone at the table. Know what type of DM you are going to have, know what type of party you're going to have, know what type of story everyone wants to tell. If you have a GM who wants to tell a terrifying uh, adventure inside of a frozen wasteland and everyone is on the brink of death and then the entire party wants to play Care Bears, um, there's going to be some disconnect. So it's it's that whole conversation of establish which is which is tone. A lot of the stuff is like references of what people say you should talk about in session zero. Um, but even still, uh, tone tone changes as you play a game. And I think another tip that relates to that is rediscuss tone after major moments. Some people will set the tone of what a game is going to be like in the session zero and then never touch it. And it's changed. It's changed in session two. It's changed in session five. It's changed in session 10. But then they never rediscuss it after those moments. There have been times when I was playing with a group and I uh, had stopped uh, after the game ended to ask a question about, hey, are we the good guys or the bad guys here? Like, what, what is it that we are playing? Because I wasn't sure where the tone was. And it was just a, I was just a member of the party, but it was realizing that the tone had changed or the tone was still changing from what we had initially talked about. And then rediscovering that at least helped me as a player at the table know what was happening. So then having that same understanding and that same link with the people at your table, with your party members, knowing, giving them that notion like, hey, this is distinctly the story that I am hoping to tell. This is the tone of what I hope the story is going to be. The story might change, but this is what I'm leaning into. Is this something that you are distinctly interested in? Because people will also say... um, People will tell you they want to play in this type of universe... So they'll say, like, I, it, I'm going to use this because it needs reference. Someone say, I want to play in the Naruto universe, and I want to be from this village, and I want to uh, be this type of person. And that is world building. 
which is huge, but it doesn't tell you what the game is going to feel like when you're playing. Something that I really think more GMs I would like to see happen is emphasize when they're saying, this is the type of story I wanna tell. I want to tell a gritty story that is a little bit hard and a little bit sad and a little bit tough, but will have a positive, happy ending in the end. That is the story that I wanna tell. And that gives people, when you're inviting them, when you have them at your table, they have something to gauge off of. They have something to use. They have something to learn from. If they, some, knowing there's a happy ending in the end, it can be reassuring. It can change how someone's going to play. It can change what someone's going to enjoy. And it's, it's kind of like acting. Like people will read their script and scripts change and evolve as different things happen. And then you reevaluate what the story is. You reevaluate the script is. So as things happen and develop, as a GM, I'd highly enthuse that you reevaluate what the tone of the story that you're telling is at major points with the players. If, if there is, for example, if there's a character death, if there's a character death and it's it's sad, it's actively upsetting, sad, it's heartbreaking. And then you sit and talk with this party and say, hey, that was tough. That sucked. Um, we don't think this person is going to be revived or at least not now. What sort of tone? Or like or like this is the kind of tone that I was going to lean in for these next couple episodes. Let's do something that's a little more lighthearted, something a little... Uh, happier, a little more jovial, uh, and then we'll revisit this. How does that sound? Have any because it's it's like having check-ins, but check-ins that aren't just about where people are. Check-ins about what people want to do next. And if you have things that you would like to do as the GM, put those up front. Put those at the forefront, offering saying, "Hey, this is the stuff that I was going to lean into next. This is the stuff that I was going to tell next. This is the stuff that I had planned in mind next." Because also, since this is everyone at the table's game, like when you all trust each other, when you work together, when you're having fun together, when you're doing this together, when you have this conversation and you might find out, actually, I, I just don't feel up to that right now. And it could be because of something that happened. It could be because of something in their personal life. Um, there's There's often the desire that everything has to be a surprise. Uh, and I've, I've really been outside of that, which is why there's like lines and veils and stuff like that. And I think, I think we could do really well with um, not even like a full lines and veils, but like if, if there are those many things, more, more moments that are like, these are some themes that are possible. These are some themes that like are are available depending on choices that you make. Would you like more of these themes? Would you like less of these things? Just just because again, you never know what's happening in someone's life. And if we're all there to have fun, when it becomes it it, it becomes hard when there's a balance of fun versus storytelling because uh focusing on certain storytelling might not be fun for everyone at the table and you can share those moments and swap those moments but as gm it's it can be frustrating we become facilitators we become guides and we should not have all the answers we are not there to uh solve all of the issues with our party, we are not there to resolve everything. Um, we can be there to help, but we're also still just people. Like we are not, we don't exist in a state where we are the ones that have to fix all of the problems. Because in a lot of ways, we are just an equal player as the rest of the party is. And it, I think it gets forgotten sometimes. There are, there are plenty of people who like run production of a show that are a player and they might have way more roles behind the scenes that they have to really get into. But we are still just a player. And I, so I mentioned the tone. Um, so tips for establishing that tone in a clear way. 
writing it up makes a difference. There are there's a bunch of documents online like setting tone for a game, setting tone for a session. Um, people will give you like check boxes, or if you just make your own check boxes, if you make check boxes about theme, like or feelings or sensations or like confrontation, and just being like, hey, this this episode is, even if you don't give away too much. And no trolls. That's that that actually that actually still. I'll I'll lean into that one later. I got you. Um, when you have the tone that you're setting, I even said just telling them this is going to be darker and grittier, and that can be the tone for the game. That can be the tone for the session, and you. I actively want you to remember that checking in when you wonder if you should is better to do than not checking in at all because like if you check in and people don't need a check in then it's fine if you check in and everyone is good with where it's going everyone is good with where it's going then it's fine and if you consider that you should have checked in and you don't that's more the moment when you lose something If you're nervous and you check in and someone is frustrated at you for checking in, there's probably something outside of this game that is an affecting factor. There is a possibility this might not be the person for your table. But if you feel like you want to check in or you need to check in and you do and you find a problem that was there that you didn't know was there, you find a way around, you find a way to set a tone in a different way, or you just find out that everything is perfect, that there is so much more to gain than not. And checking in to actively say, is this tone still fine? Is everyone still comfortable? Is this still good? Are we still leaning in the right way? That helps. It helps way more than you think. And sometimes that can just be enough of what people need to hear to know that they can check in, to know that you will check in, to know that you'll ask questions, to know that they have an idea of where you are. (sighs) So one of... That's that you know what that's that's a great thing to do though. Like that's asking before the session, are we playing silly, serious, or scary today? I love that. That is straight to the point, that is blunt, that is forward, that is sincere. And then you get a notion. Like like if one person's like if one person's like, eh, I'm kind of feeling silly, and everyone else is like, well, semi serious, you can find a middle ground. You can find a middle ground between that because if these people want serious and this person wants silly, you kind of know exactly how to gauge it for what your party wants. Like letting letting people tell you. Just letting them tell you directly is a great way to do it. I absolutely support that derailed. Um, something, so something else that is a learned skill uh, is knowing when to guide versus just let them loose. Oh, Lord. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's talk about that one a little bit more in detail. Um, Lord, because I am sure that plenty of you who GM have had moments where your party just goes wild. Like you give them you give them a little bit to work with and then you're distracted for like half an hour or an hour or they're spending 30 minutes talking to a stump. 30 minutes talking to a stump, 20 minutes talking to a hawk, an hour talking to a horse. But they keep going because they're like it's it's interesting, it's fun. Uh or just easily distracted. So you gotta find a balance of when to reel them in versus have them let loose. And there's there's no, as with most things, there's no singular answer of how to do it. Kind of gauge your time. If they're running and racing against the clock, it's okay to nudge them or guide them. And if, if you, like, there's, so, like, uh, d was saying, just asking directly before a session, just asking directly questions, it's actually a great choice. 
there were like there are moments when I have literally just said, "Hey y'all, um, the, I'm going to guide us a little bit just to get us to where we need to be." Because sometimes you only have so much time when you have one shots that you're playing through, especially if it's like a streamed or you only have so much time. We love tabletop games because we can treat them like a gigantic sandbox. It also means that we might have a little bit more of a time frame that we have to keep to. We might only have three hours, and if we have spent an hour talking to the first tree that we met, we've got two hours to go get to the big bad, rescue them uh, from this cursed object inside of their body, then take them to this fountain where they can be replenished and cured of all the evil, and then uh, take them back to their family that's been missing them for a week. So if you have long campaigns, sometimes you just want them to explore. They enter a room. You have no idea what they're going to do next inside of this room. There's dozens of different objects to interact with the room. You describe it, and then you just let loose. You just let them loose to run around, roll, mess with whatever objects they want to, see what happens next. You got to figure out... <laughs> it sounds like an interesting tree, though. It is an interesting tree. So it's it's finding out what moments for your GM style specifically are the best that you want to just let them loose, set them free, have them run around and explore these things versus the moments when you need to, like, guide them a little bit. Because it's okay to be distracted and explore and not positive about what they want to do next. And it might be that, like, even you just have a time in your head, like... There, there are plenty of times that when I'm playing a game, I set up a timer on my phone. And like when they enter a new room, I'll set a timer for like two minutes, three minutes. And then I'll just hit the button and just let them do whatever they want for those like two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. And if they haven't opened the door to the next step, if they haven't unlocked the path to the next step, I might give them a hint or something. Setting time limits for myself of what it's, it's like an escape room. When they haven't found something and you at least want to keep driving the story forward a little bit or giving them a nudge in the right direction, set time limits for yourself. Set time limits for when you want the next thing to happen. Treat it like it's a video game or a movie. Like there is the world is still moving while the people are standing there. If they want to spend their hour in game or out of game just running around this room, you, the GM, consider what's happening during that time. And then when the world becomes living, when it becomes moving, when it's acting, it makes things a little bit more interesting when they realize. They realize if, you fi if they find out they spent an hour in this room and half an hour ago the big bad got out, it's like, oh, wait, they were still here. And I don't even mean that in a way of don't treat that as a way to punish your party for exploring other things and getting distracted. Uh, I mean it more in a way of giving them the ability to interact with a living world so that whether you guide them to a point or they choose to explore and go around, it still feels like something is happening. It still feels like this world is developing and growing and acting. <sighs> So a hard one is uh, tips on what to do when something goes wrong. Uh, if a member of the party dies, if a powerful, incredible, dramatic moment fails, if the big bad for whatever they were trying to do succeed, what to do next? One of the first steps, in my opinion, stop and talk. Um, message one of the party members privately if their character has died. Check in with them, see what's happening. See how they feel. Uh, use the safety cards, X and O, which are available all over. And just see where people are. Uh, recently, there was there was a, essentially a TPK on uh, the finale for Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, and we took a little break. Like after everything was going to hell, we took a little break, and that was a great choice in my opinion. 
just having it stop to calm and check in and see what's happening. Because it's it should always just be a game. Uh, that's and it can be hard because we get very passionate about games. We care about the stuff. We care about the characters. We care about these stories. We care about these worlds that we're weaving together and these ideas that we're we're sowing in our own minds. And when something goes wrong, especially as a GM, it's hard not to feel responsible. I hope that you've been able to establish a sense that when these people are playing in these games, that they're playing against a game and not you. Trying to clarify the whole sense that you're playing against a game and you're not playing against me, that's that's something that I really stand by. I, I never want a member of my party to feel like they have to they have to play against Gabe. Gabe is trying to kill them. Gabe is the one that wants them to fail. I I actively hate that. Like it's it is it frustrates me so much. It is it is one of the things that I avoid the most. And like some people joke about it, but like that it that it drives me up a wall. Because I that's never what I want to put out. I never want someone to think Gabe tried to kill me. Gabe wanted to kill my character. Gabe wanted uh, to see my character suffer. Because that is never the case. Um, And as I play characters and as I learn about this world and try to blend it together and have the world act and live, it, it becomes hard. It's tough. So when it goes wrong... Checking in to make sure that, like, A, they don't feel like Gabe wanted this to happen. Making sure that they're okay, making sure that if they're not, that we can talk about it and figure it out. When the big bad fails, get its tone. Giving them that tonal break of just seeing something good come next. And I hope all of you see that this stuff keeps connecting back to the different ideas. It's it's all one over-encompassing bit of knowledge that I've learned through trial, error, and practice. That's why I keep mentioning all the different ideas that I've said before as I label more and more of the things that I've been thinking. When it goes wrong, figuring out what to do next might be the best thing for everyone. Because you can let them take a failure and make it motivate them. Them failing, the big bad succeeding in what they're doing, it doesn't have to kill everyone. It doesn't, it could literally just be that they stole something that now could be a calamity in the future. It's it's like getting a new season. Do that. Let your players, like, in it their entirety feel, it's such a hard habit to break. Let the party feel like, the big bad only succeeded and it now gives them a new, like that's that's the new season. That happens in television and especially anime and cartoons all the time. Because it's like, what happens next? Let that moment of something going wrong just be a lull. Lead into something bigger, something more dramatic, something wild. And then tell that story. Tell that next story. I love that stuff. Big Bad's been in my world, not as often as I might like, but pretty often, actually. Um, World building together. World building together is another tip that I don't think happens enough. Um, When you're building this world for your party to play in, ask them questions about what they want. Ask them questions on what they want to see. Ask them questions on what they want to be in the world. Ask them questions on what they want to play with. Ask them questions on like, hey, are there items? Are there themes? Are there spells? Are there bits of technology? Like things that you really, really want to see in this world. Are there locations that you would love to visit? Do you want to do some underwater stuff? Do you want to do some sailing? Do you want to do some air shipping? Is that a thing? I don't know, probably. Um... But do that collaborative world building so that you can literally 
uh, build a world that has everything you want in it. And then it has what they want to explore in it. Phone, quiet. No, don't vibrate twice. Oh my gosh. Um, I love collaborative world building, especially because then I don't have to answer all of the questions. Uh, and if, if, so if you're a GM, um, this, this is kind of like an open-ended question. You know, I should have to answer, but when was the last time you let a party member name an NPC? When was the last time you let a party member name a town? When was the last time you let a party member describe what a tavern was like? What a field was like, what a forest was like, what a cave was like. When was the last time you had a party member uh, describe an NPC that showed up? All the time. I love making them do the work for me. Oh my gosh, Jess. But yeah, like I, I let, let them walk into a tavern and describe what it smells like. Let them walk into a town and describe what the air feels like. Now it's going to be a bit of improv for you to like link to it, play along with it run into it and then be like, well, you know what? It's, it's, you know what? It is this, it is this, it is, it is a very happy, bubbly, bouncing uh, day in the town today. There's a festival happening. Like it, it lets them do some of the work for you. And then also makes it exciting and interesting for you because you still get to be surprised. It's one of the best ways to let me still feel like a player at this table. I let the party members describe things and then I get to be excited about something I didn't know. If I tell them that like there is a humongous skeletal figure with a sword in their hand looking at the party. Uh, but Jason, describe what they look like. And Jason's like, okay, it's um, they've got little tufts of hair on their body. And their, their sword actually has uh, a skeleton's mouth open. That's where the hilt is. Uh, and it's flaming. And I'm like, oh. What? And it's, it's that exciting moment of, like, seeing what they do next. What they're building up and, like, how they're visualizing it. So, like, uh, already said, 100%, I love having party members narrate when we arrive at locations from their backstory. That's, yes, because you're, you're giving them that player agency, that agency to tell a story, and you let them make it real. You let them make it real in the way that they have it. And it, like, even if it's letting them do the work for you, you're also letting them have the moment to visualize it the way that they want it. It's not, it's not leaving room for error of, like, any ideas that the GM might have. It's literally saying, this is your moment. This is your place. This is your backstory. What does this place look like? Because I don't want to have to give them all of their answers, especially to something that they wanted to create, that they wanted to do, that they care about. I want them to be able to tell this story in the way they want to do it. And then them giving, because that's another thing that we as GMs have. The people at our table are giving us the power, the ability, the grace to influence and alter parts of their story, to influence and alter things that they have thought of in the past, to influence and alter things that they want to see. And they're trusting us with that. And I don't say that in a sense of pressure or making you feel overwhelmed. I say that in a sense that they're trusting us that we can have fun together with an idea that they had. And especially lately, that's, it's an amazing feeling. <laughs> uh, but Prince said, I honestly have trouble world building in a vacuum nowadays. Need that sweet player input. I agree. Because there's also things that, there's things that I will have never thought of that someone else does. Um, I post on Twitter all the time asking for player prompts and trying to get curiosity or input from other people because I'm curious what they have to say, what they think would make this world more interesting, what they think will be a bonus addition to my stuff. And often I am blown away. I'm like, that's so smart. I never thought of that. Someone had mentioned um, 
an ability of like basically creating uh, thin spider webs and then weaving it and layering it more and more to make them tighter and stronger. And then an ultimate ability of basically like snapping their fingers and then someone's inside of a giant spider web. And I'm like, Gabe's brain would have never thought of that, but that is cool as hell. I've there there have been times when as as strange as this is um letting letting the like party members and the players that control them build their like antagonist like saying okay let's let's build a baddie what do you want them to be i want a gigantic metal death knight i'm like Okay, cool. Um, what powers do they have? Uh, the powers of duplication. Terrifying. And those these two people had probably completely different ideas, but they just had notions of what they thought would be interesting and cool. And we ended up making a metal death knight that could duplicate themselves that literally could also like absorb darkness into their body. So there was a shadow duplicating death knight duplicating death knight that was just around the world attacking consuming and in my head i'm like oh my god this is the perfect baddie and they just they like after i had been given a concept this gift of a concept from this great group of people i had something amazing to work off of but i'd never even considered it and so having that moment it just it just helps um, Trolls Meden, Trolls Meden, Meden, Meden. I let my players name most of their background NPCs, but they also have three I know a person options during the campaign to let them introduce NPCs that might help them. Oh, that's genius. That's so cool. So they have moments of like, ah, oh, we're looking for someone that can help us fend stuff. And then they use their thing. They use, oh, okay, I'm glad you have questions. So they use their thing to be like, uh, you know, can I use my I know a person? I, I know a fence, actually, who lives in the woods that has a bit of a Thieves Guild aspect, has a bit of a Thieves Guild background to them. That's so clever. Let them say, uh, and then derailed, sketch, let them say one thing that is true for every one, for every five points they beat the history, arcana, whatever check. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Like if if they beat it, if if your check is like fifteen, they beat it by like twenty. Not by twenty. They get a twenty total. Good lord, they beat it by I mean if they beat it they could beat it by twenty, I guess, technically. Um But letting them have that moment. I love that. So okay, we have we have some questions. Uh Jess, can you pull up a question for me? Modifying circles from burning will for 5e. Ooh. Question, how do you get your players to role play more of their actions in combat? I honestly, I, I try to reward them for doing it. Like, um, one, of, one of the hardest things is, bleh, uh, especially in, in game systems that like you get a specific number of attacks um, I love narrative stuff. I love the idea that like one attack roll, it's not, it doesn't have to just be one swing. It's like, uh, they roll, someone rolls their attack and it's like, they swing, 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 swing. But then the one attack finds purchase. Like the one attack hits cleanly where it needs to. And sometimes with narrative games, it's a little hard uh, with, with games. It's a little hard to use that narrative, but uh, something that if you if you really want to get them to role play more of their actions in combat, have the enemy NPCs do that. Or uh, if you feel up to it, narrate a little bit for them. So if someone's like, uh, you know what, I go to strike the boar. Uh, nah, let's go Minotaur. Minotaur is cool. They're like, I go to strike the Minotaur. And they make their role, they hit the Minotaur, uh, and then you ask them questions. Like, okay, so you charge up to this Minotaur, and how do you try to strike them? 
what do you try to do? They like stumble towards you and then you see a clean shot at their face. What do you, what are you swinging with? You kick, are you punching? How do you do it? Asking them questions and then guiding them a little bit will get them more comfortable to just answer those questions, to have that thought process, to start thinking of that on their own. And it's just, it's just getting them and getting them there initially giving them that little push in the direction to be like, can, can I try to roundhouse kick the Minotaur? Yes, you absolutely can. Go ahead and make you, make that attack. Go ahead and try and do it. Uh, leaning into that, the Minotaur comes and swings down at you. They swing one fist and you dodge to the left. They swing again, you dodge to the right, and they're coming down for a proper attack. And maybe that's when the Minotaur actually rolls to attack. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I absolutely get that stuff because it's you want them to feel like they have narrative power. They have some narrative control. So even if they like fail, even if they miss, it still feels cool. I let letting letting failures feel good is one of my favorite things. Um in D&D and Pathfinder and Cyberpunk Red Something that I've done is, uh, Zweihander even, something that I do is I'll, I'll just narrate a little bit uh, and you, like you pull out your short sword and you swing, <laughs> roll 20 is your birthday, uh, you, you take a swing and they duck back, but then you swing again and as you're coming down, you see their shield start to coming, uh, you, see the, you see their shield start to come up, uh, make your roll, let's see if you're faster than their shield is. So then it's a moment of like, it's not even that like just they missed something worked against them something worked against them but it's not that they failed to do something it's just that someone else succeeded against them and if if the attack doesn't hit then the shield came up the sh the shield comes up and deflects it and you hear metal scraping as you come across and then just roll back a little bit it was close but you didn't you didn't hit you didn't find purchase that narrative of like giving them even that failure it just makes it interesting because then it's it's i i'm an anime person i love over the top powerful battles all of that stuff so getting those moments especially in games like even if just giving them the moment of like oh you had it you slam your fist into the shield but you cannot dent it oh you bring your fist around but they deflect it very quickly rather than just hit miss hit miss hit miss because like that's that's what makes fights interesting fights get interesting because someone missed or someone deflected it or someone blocked an attack like that is what makes fights interesting to me because it's like who's going to get the final hit who's going to get the true hit that is where the gamble is so it if you can find ways to just narratively and add to that dialogue so that like missing feels interesting, missing feels cool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So exactly that. If an attack doesn't meet the AC, it doesn't mean the attack missed the target. Only that the target didn't lose any focus or blood from that attack. I love that. Yeah. All the shockwaves. All right. So there was another question. Let me go read that one. Uh, what's the best way to provide new players you're DMing? What's the best way to provide new players you're DMing for with a lot of information, i.e. they get to a place that has 10 different side quests? Oh, I love doing this stuff. Uh, so if, if, if you're playing your games on Roll20, you can make handouts. I have made like little random handouts for a bunch of different towns that I have. And then you can just like share that with, the players you can have like five or six different handouts for the five or six different towns that you have but giving it to them in a written down format um i i would enthuse saying stuff out loud like still say it out loud so people can hear it uh that way everyone hears it at least once and it's in their head that it exists but giving them a written handout uh, using like Roll20's handout, like sending them a message, putting it in a chat and like pinning it in a message, giving them a place to read it at their own leisure is going to be a huge boon to you. And like, it's, it's actually one of the reasons why 
the handout feature is one of my favorites. So Gabe is talking about this as almost more of a like person who GMs on Roll20 than just someone who also works with Roll20. The reason I like handouts, even when I'm just a member of the party, is because if something else is happening, if something else is going on, if everyone else is talking about stuff, and Gabe is still thinking about that weird, like that weird dog mission that was on the like the bounty board, then I can go back and read it. And when you have them having that information accessible, they don't have to interrupt the GM to stop and talk about something. They don't have to be like, "Hey, can you remind me what that thing was?" Um, it is it is very helpful when your party takes notes. Um, but I'd really argue more that if the GM already has notes that they took, you can just share them. Like if if someone really wants to pursue an idea that you crafted, if someone's really interested in something that you were mentioning to them, if someone is really interested about this one aspect of their world, of this world that you crafted, that you mentioned, and they forgot to take notes or they don't have notes about it, and you have notes about it, you don't have to give them everything, but give them something because they're excited about what you made. They wanna invest time in what you made. They're interested in that thing you wrote about. So give it to them because then they'll pursue it. They're already interested. There's, there's the whole sense of like, if you don't take notes, then tough luck. I, I can't be that GM myself. I'm terrible with taking notes all the time as a, as a party member. Like, I know I am. Cause, because I'm so focused on what's happening or my brain is racing and I'm distracted by, like, everything on the board that taking notes can be so hard for me to do. And if it's hard for me to do, even while I'm a GM, I can't blame my party members for not taking notes either. There'll be plenty of times when one of the party members does something weird as hell. And then I'm like, um, that person's name is Derek. Hello, Derek. Hello, my name is Derek. And my name is um, 36 and I'm happy to eat apples. And it's like Derek didn't exist before. I don't have a whole bunch of notes on Derek's backstory. I just kind of made this up in the moment. And it's there, there's plenty of times when like my party members have had notes that I forgot to take. So I I ah, blah, 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 blah. I genuinely just like like the handouts, they will they will make your life so much easier. And if there's information that you want people to remember, even if it's just loose information like names of NPCs that they met, people that are in the tavern, uh, you don't have to give them all of the stuff. You can have and uh, something that's really nice about Roll20 handouts is you can have a general note section and there is also a GM notes section. So if you wanted to just give them uh, a handout that was like, there is this elf and this gnome and this squirrel person in the tavern, you can just list their descriptions and like general ways that they were reacting in the tavern and in the notes the gm notes you can have specific names you can have all of the detailed information that you want to write about these people so technically making handouts is good for your party and it's good for you because if you don't want to have all of the information in those notes you can still have it on the page but just hidden underneath if there's like extra little bonus parts to the bounties if there's like Oh, well, bounty number two, uh, the creature in the well, uh, there's so you, there's like a second bounty on the bounty board. Bounty number two is there is some strange billowing, bubbling noise coming out of the well. Um, and in the GM notes, you could write bounty number two, there's a kraken in the well. <laughs> like, and that could just be for you. They can look at the notes whenever they want to, but they don't have to see your specific notes. And if they're like, oh, well, I want to go back to the bounty board and they're opening that note, you also know to open it. And then you have your stuff specially hidden away, written down below. All right. Keep your secrets. So let me see. I, yo, uh, Yeti, if you have a personal notepad, I support the hell out of that. I, I have one too. I have, um, 
what what I've often done is that if it's notes that I'm giving to the party, I will use the handouts. And if I'm writing notes for myself, I'll usually just write them down for myself. So it's it makes it makes sense to me of like yeah, having having your own notes and like a nice little collection and then you can carry it around with you and everything. Absolutely. Good. There's so much chat that's been happening. Uh, handouts are great for when they find magic items they haven't identified, just having a picture. Yeah, that's another good thing. Like if, if you have visual references, the handouts are really useful because then you can just give them a visual of it. Um, with with like monsters and stuff, uh, or like because if you have Pathfinder monsters, D&D monsters, and they have the compendium stuff, you can show to players just to show them the artwork without showing the stats, which is really fun. Uh, because they'll be like, oh, it's cute. And then that's like a CR like 13 and then they're terrified. I'm not a monster, I swear. Uh, I want to write more notes when I'm playing, but also know I am a slow writer and don't want to hold down the party to wait for me to write it down. Uh, Troll, if I can offer a suggestion for that, something that I often do, uh, if it's a stream show, I'll go back myself sometimes and double check anything uh if it's not a stream show and it's like just playing with friends or something i'll like record voice notes for myself while i'm playing the game like literally if i'm if i'm like talking about something for a character and i'm like oh this is getting interesting i'll literally like open up my phone's recorder and then just hit the button as i'm talking and you see this large town it seems like there's bats coming out of it uh, along with a dozen ravens and there is vines and moss and trees all around. So like having little notes for yourself because the way that you take notes, the best way for you to take notes is whatever you determine the best way for it is. Um, I like doing the voice recording because then it helps me and I don't have to think as much. I can go back and listen to it. That's actually what I do when I'm trying to remember NPC voices. I'll like, I make a little recording of like, 30 seconds, 40 seconds long for NPC voices, just so that like when I want to revisit them, I can be like, what did Derek sound like? Blah, 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 blah. Oh yeah, that's right, Derek sound like. Like giving giving myself little tips and tricks that way. Uh, often thought about writing session summaries, like they're part of an epic tale. I haven't, session summaries would be awesome. There's a lot of people I know that do like, uh, ask someone to do a recap and then giving inspiration for it. Huh. <sighs> I hmm. session summaries even even if that's just for like your own party having session summaries could be a huge boon too because then if someone's like what happened two sessions ago they go back look at that little session summary and come back to it when I read write my notes it's like obscure poetry is this a haiku if your GM notes are a haiku that's dope as hell <laughs> I read that taking notes is good for people with ADHD. And I, I think, I think it is true. I think like I've, I've been trying to take more notes in general stuff that I do because then, yeah, it helps keep me on track. And if I don't have any pre like pre-written notes, the notes also help me build on to what happens next. My brain is like, oh, actually this is clever. The next could be this thing. So even even if you're just taking notes in a moment for yourself, just just a quick little thing or like you write down. I have I have so many word bad documents open uh, and so many being four. But I have I have notes that say hawk with two hatchlings, Minnesota accent, uh, thistle bloom, three good berries, healing herbs, the fancy orc. Um, and it's like they're not like without without knowing background that's not super helpful but Gabe knows what they are and it's it's that whole sense of like if you're taking notes for yourself your notes can just be for you too they don't have to be perfect they can just be your notes like this this I know this episode is kind of unconventional because there's going to be uh there's there's dozens of other videos out there that are like GM tips and tricks here are the top 10 things to do as a, a game master or a dungeon master and all of them have pretty good information. Like all of, all of them have something to them. So the reason I wanted to talk about stuff that wasn't just uh, do these things with your dice, do these things for your players, uh, do everything else for 
yeah, don't trick your players. Uh, try to do these clever things to catch them off guard. Um, this this was a lot more of me just hoping that people remember, like, again, they're just people wanting to play a game with you. All of these social things that you keep in mind, that stuff stays at the table. All of the little collaborations that you want to do, you can do that. You don't have to do all of the work your own. You can lean on this party to help you tell this story. They want to play with you. They want to tell the story together. They want to be creative. And if you can help them do it, then that's going to be the best. Yeah. Rule number one, have fun. I, I like trying to remind that and establish that. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I record voice notes on my phone all the time, too. I record voice. I, I, have, I have downloaded a voice recorder app because I make so many voice notes on my phone. And that's the only thing I use it for. Like voice notes for my tabletop games. Voice notes for specifically for one game. So then every now and then I'll like hit the button, go back to it and I'll know what it is. And if I don't need it anymore, I'll just delete it. But it's it's a great way to save it. It's a great way to have it all in one place and it's organized. And then when you're done with it, you can just delete it. You could even install the whole app if you wanted to. And my girlfriend's game, we do a cop game and she has us do police reports to summarize the last games. That's clever. <laughs> the conversation with the hawk and the Minnesota accent. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's so many ways to do this. Um, and please, please take to heart when I say this. You can be your ideal. Oh, my gosh. Roll 20 is your birthday. I'm going to fight you. You can be your ideal GM. You can become your ideal GM. You don't have to be everyone's ideal GM either. You are absolutely capable of being an amazing storyteller. And not being considered an amazing storyteller to that group does not mean you are not an amazing storyteller to that group. You can have this group that you always enjoy playing with and this group that you don't feel comfortable playing with. Both can exist, and one does not mean that you are worse. Finding the groups that you play well with, finding the groups that you're happy with, finding the groups that you're comfortable with, that is a big part of being a GM. Perfect and ideals are weird as hell uh, and often unrealistic. We, we, see, we see DMs out there and GMs and storytellers who have absolutely astounding levels of preparation, um, so many resources, so much backing, so much creative drive and passion and have the answers to all of these questions and know exactly where to look that does not mean that they are better than you. Like, I, I want that to be very, very clear. They might be better for a specific group than you, but that does not mean that they are better than you because it is not quantitative of how good a GM you are. If the people that you play with have fun, if the people that you are at this table with are having a good time, and so are you, that, that can define you being a good GM. When you're all having fun. And if everyone is having a good time, and if the next week or the next session everyone is still having a good time, or the next session everyone is still having a good time, then you might be the perfect DM for that group. And all these tips and tricks and anything that you learn along the way, that stuff is going to help you with that group. And maybe the next one. And maybe a third one after that. That's what defines a good GM. You get to define what sort of GM you are. 
and the groups that you play with. Yeah. Yes, don't don't be a martyr when it comes to prep and world building. If you're having if you're having trouble building something, talk to your group about it. You can lit I there have been moments where I had a game and I started the session. I'm like, y'all, I'm gonna be honest. I was trying to figure out what the hell was happening in this dungeon. I had no idea. So we're gonna make it up as I go. And they were like, okay, cool. <laughs> and I was like, wait, is that really okay? They're like, yeah, we don't care. We just wanted to play. Cool. Like, oh, I, someone's like, oh, I have this really interesting chart. Do you wanna see it? Yeah, show me the chart. I'd love to see it. They sent me this chart of like random stuff in a dungeon. It got so freaking weird and it was awesome. And then I got to have moments of like, like, oh God, what is in this next thing? What is this next thing? Balancing combat uh, and combat flow is super hard. And troll, something else if I can if I can say, don't forget that you can you can change the rules. Like you can make it up. Make it make it the game that you all want it to be. Because at the end of the day, it's you're the ones playing. W what is right and wrong is defined by you all before anybody else. Yep. Yeah. Close enough. And yeah, it's it's a game. It is a game. It is a game. We are here to have fun. If it is exhausting you, then there's something that we have to change and improve on. I, you got, you, we need to let ourselves have fun. DMing is, is in a lot of ways a job. Uh, I have done GMing as work. I do GMing stuff for charity. Um, and every time I do it, I, I should be able to leave the table smiling and having enjoyed what I did. The same goes for all of you. I mean, maybe, maybe Gaze NPC. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Give, give C, give CR one creatures legendary actions. I'm going to start a hashtag campaign about that right now. You think I won't? No, you you know I will. Hi, buddy. Make CR1 creatures with legendary actions. <laughs> now we wait. <laughs> <laughs> What have you done? What, don't enthuse me. The last fight was a boss fight with a giant boar that was in What the hell? A giant boar that was infused with green dragon souls and had a breath weapon and lair actions. That's awesome. So that's another good GM tip. Take resources that already exist and mash them up. Um... Take a monster that already exists, and if you're like, you know, I, hello, roll positive. If you're, if you're literally like, oh, you know what, I want this, I'm going to use a skeleton, I want this skeleton to fight like a minotaur. Use the minotaur stats. Just, just use the minotaur stats and call him a skeleton. Because... You <laughs> have the power to change this world in whatever way you want. You want, like, if if you want the little mushroom person to have the stats of an ancient green dragon, do it. A legendary goblin that can always succeed on deck saving throws. Yeah, yeah, templates. Like, just just take the world, throw it up on its head. Take a creature, make it meta. Yes. Oh, Mecha, not Meta. Or both. It if if you want Warforged versions of creatures, make Warforged versions of creatures. 
<laughs> Dark Root Garden. Like, it's... That's that's something else that's really interesting. It's... If you... Like, <laughs> creatures exist uh, as creatures that you can use and guidelines. But you can always change them. You can always change them. If, if you want this entire undead army, but you don't have the undead that you want, take something and make it undead. Take that purple worm... Make it an undead purple worm. Shambling mound, but it's wires of learning and trying stuff. Yes. Do it. I'm here. The campaign world hasn't had any dragons in over 100 years, and any traces of referencing them has been erased by a mystic group. The campaign season one is the group finding out the dragons are real and what happens to them. Oh my gosh. I creep my players out by attacking them with my own brand of zombie that are actually filled with insect swarms that emerge when the zombie is damaged. That's horrifying. Why would you do that? I mean, it's funny. I would do it. I would absolutely do that, actually. <laughs> oh and the tweet goes why would you do that gave immediately taking notes they pretty much agree with you zombies but prince how dare you how dare you Taking take a red dragon, give it conjure elementals, conjure minor elemental spells as the lair action. Okay, so we we didn't really talk about homebrew. Um, make things up, <laughs> like all the time. No matter what the game says, what what the game is like. Hey, you use these skills to do this stuff. Uh, this spell always does this. Make it up if you want to. You can make it up. If someone's like, can I, can I use <laughs> investigation while I'm, no. Someone's like, can I use performance uh, to convince this person uh, that I am an exotic dancer rather than deception? And they're like, yeah, sure, whatever, go for it. I'm here for it. Whenever I'm down, let's do it. Or someone's like, hey, can I use uh, Produce Flame to light this? Leo, what are you eating? Oh, okay. Can I use Produce Flame to light this grease fire, which is a horrible idea, but someone actively wants to do it? I'm like, yeah, sure, do it. Whatever, whatever. Like, let, <laughs> make it up. If if you want to make a, a a zombie that's immune to holy damage because they're a clerical zombie, freaking do it. Freaking like, it's it's your world. You can make it as weird or interesting as you want to do it. Oh hell yeah, five e my hero. Let's the principles of pat a platypus. Oh has a platypus. Okay okay. <laughs> Uh, Warforged Monch is going to add a book in the world that is notes on how to make a Warforged arm. Let the dwarf artificer find it so they can learn how to create one, but the twist is that they need to offer a soul to give it life. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was Leo. He walked by. He's a sleepy boy. He, yes, he is 100% still unimpressed by my dance moves. He kind of just looks at me like... disrespectful but that's my boy i haven't actually made i haven't made anything inspired by him yet maybe i will it'll probably be like an animal spirit so it's not an actual animal that people can hurt but something that can just exist in the games like conjure animals conjure leo This is your world. This is your world to have fun. Chemical clerical zombie. Assistant to a lich walking around with a quill and a clipboard. Oh, God. 
What have we unleashed in the world? Oh, ladies and Honestly, trolls, like one of one of the best suggestions I can give when you're trying to get feedback on like GM stuff, if you post that stuff to Twitter, people will find it so fast. People will find it so fast. Because people people love to read through stuff on Twitter. Twitter is actually one of the best places that when I'm like looking for tips and tricks on ideas for GM stuff, I'll even just ask. Uh, I made a player tear up as I added her dog as a companion to the owner of the inn. They were talking to me from pick of her dog. Oh my God, that's adorable. Wings, adding wings on a lion or making a fish that can walk on land. <laughs> a winged lioness, one could say. Hey, well, look at that. Lions, lions do not come with wings. I honestly, I just use D and D, D and D five E, because there's there is dozens of people that can see it, or like those what hashtags you use <laughs> roll twenty as your birthday. That's gonna haunt me for the rest of this month. Broom of animated attack as a porcelain doll with smudge face, terrifying, terrifying. That's true. RPG is good. Especially if you're looking for game mechanics. Lord, I think we might have just made a, a terrible world where there's a bunch of CR1 creatures with legendary actions. <laughs> like. <laughs> oh. just keep thinking about skeletons but like god yes well no CR one half creatures with legendary reactions mm. I just now I'm just thinking of like oh god skeleton as like it's legendary action <laughs> it grows its skin back <laughs> oh no Oh, <laughs> God. It gets worse the more I think about it. So, yeah, like legendary resistance, so I could like automatically succeed a saving throw and not take damage. Just make everything mimics. Couldn't you make a mimic that's. You can make a mimic that looks like a skeleton. Oh my God, the skeleton could be a mimic. Every bone has a mimic. Every tooth is a mimic. And they're playing a piano that's also a mimic. And the piano keys are like... Why is it still... Ugh. Thank you all of you for coming to this episode of Tabletop Table Talk. About GM tips, tricks... <laughs> And things. 
<laughs> this this derailed so fast. But I kind of like that. CR zero cockroach with infinite legendary resistance. I would do that. Mimic colony. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh, ooh. You might <laughs> hold on. <laughs> you might be onto something. But yes, it, all things considered, like considered, all things considered. Thank you for coming out for another episode of Tabletop Table Talk. Um, I like just <laughs> Mimic Cert One on One Mimic University. I like talking about this stuff. I like talking about this stuff because we get through like. <laughs> I did. I, Ice Icewind Dale aged me. Icewind Dale really got me. It really did. I'm, I look a little more like Vajrux now. That's what it is. I just I just wanted to talk through this stuff. Um, it's one of the fun things about like creating and telling stories together and then talking through the stuff. Getting through my little list of tips and tricks early on. That stuff that's more about the social aspect of GMing rather than just the mechanical and logical aspect. That's true. That's true. Is this the real one? Or and yeah, this is the real one. Gabe doesn't do clones. If I I will if I had the ability, I would never clone myself. I'm getting derailed, but I'm just gonna say, I will never clone myself. I cloning terrifies the hell out of me. Because if there's another Gabe, he's going to have the same idea. And one of us is going to win. So thank you again for just coming out and talking about this stuff and discussing and 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 having <laughs> right, Chloe up a hive mind and just having that reminder that the GM's a player. When we're GMing, we just want to have fun. We can rely on our table to help us craft stories. We make up this stuff. We can just make up the rules. It's about fun. It's a game. And then when we have these moments, like like just now, we're not all sharing a table together, obviously. But we were just sitting and talking about things that were interesting, things that would be fun, things that would be neat, adding to our worlds, building our worlds. I don't know where the hand gestures are coming from, but they are. Um... This stuff, this is what we can do at our tables. A whole brick road would just occasionally eat people. Yes, it is, it is all about communication. That might get me divorced. <laughs> Uh, so here's 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 my thing. Here's my thing. I want you to do one of two things for me. Number one, post about a personal GM tip or trick that you have. You can tag me. You can uh, tag us at Roll Twenty. You can use hashtag tabletop table talk. Just just post about a personal GM tip that you have that you think might help somebody else. It might be a little trick that you have for notes. It might be a little trick that you have for when you're working with players, for combat, for initiative, for any of those things. Post about one. Or and or number two, you know what? Make sure you use the hashtag. I lied. Hashtag roll twenty is your birthday as well. Yeah. Um, but also if you're feeling up to it and you feel like creating uh, for for like 5e, for example, make a CR1 creature and give it legendary resistance. You can look up a pre-existing one and say like, uh, or give it a legendary action. Look up uh, CR1, 2, under that. And then you can just put the name and then say what its legendary resistance or its legendary actions are. Like a dire wolf. Uh, but it's a legend. It can take a legendary action. It can spend a legendary action to duplicate itself. Oh God, that's horrifying. Oh, that's horrifying because they have pack tactics. Don't do that. Eh, do it. So one of those things. Post about a GM tip, or. 
post about a creature, like a CR1 creature or lower, and then give it a legendary action or a couple. Let's be chaotically creative. I think it's a good day for it. Oh, and happy Friday. If uh, Friday is the day before your weekend, have an amazing weekend. If Friday is not the day before your weekend, you are still dope as hell. And have a good weekend when you have your weekend. Can the new Dire Wolf also duplicate? Well, Phoenix, that's up to you. Because you are chaotically creative. Can the new Dire Wolf duplicate? I mean, if they can't, then it makes it more interesting for the people to try to find the main Dire Wolf, if you think about it. Maybe they can only duplicate up to a certain number, but you know, you tell me. I... I'm gonna go take a break. I'm gonna go walk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, room's a mess. Oh, you can't see him. He is asleep under my table. So I'm gonna go walk this fuzzy child. Dire Wolf be duplicating like the Robin Williams genie in Aladdin. Yeah, I'm gonna go walk my fuzzy child, Leo. Leo, come here. Come here. You wanna say goodbye? You wanna say goodbye? Come here. Come say goodbye. This is Leo. Mwah. Hi, buddy. Are you falling asleep in my arms? <laughs> oh, buddy. I'm gonna put you down. Blech. Yeah, he uh, he was made to be a lapdog, whether whether I uh, expected him to or not. So all of you have a great rest of your day, and I will see you next time on Tabletop Table Talk. What are you stealing? Ah, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs>